What a time to be alive, hey? Well, you know, it's not bad being alive now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> man, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live to be 100, man, unless I get some damn disease or something. And the odds are, the odds are one out of every men in this room will, one out of every two men in this room will get cancer. One of every three women will get cancer. So this is unfortunately the times we're living in. So any time you're living any day, life is such a great gift that's bestowed upon you. And that's why you've got to enjoy every single day. Wow. Feast your eyes on, well, not, not this side of the stage, this side of the stage. Two two amazing champions together and uh, two old buddies I um, won't say old I mean you've known each other a long time that's that's what I mean by that you've known each other for a long time I'm going to start by asking each of you your impression and opinion of of each other as you've known each other for so long let's start with you Gary you've known Tony a long time as a player as a competitor as a friend I wish I had the vocabulary of my all-time hero uh, Sir Winston Churchill to have the capabilities of putting it to the fore. Uh, I've known Tony for a long time. He was the most charismatic golfer Britain has ever had. He could have been a bullfighter. He could have been a motor car driver. And what he did was, and I vividly remember because I've been playing in this great country since 1955. And they used to have the Ryder Cup, and I never honestly used to even look on a Monday to see who'd won it. It was a foregone conclusion. And along came this man and inspired people to play well. You see, leadership is something that is an essential ingredient in life. And he had that at the right time. The Open was a foregone conclusion that a British player was not going to win. And he comes along and he wins the Open, and then he follows up with the U.S. Open. I mean, something that golf, British golf, really needed at the right time. Timing is such an important thing. And he went on to win tournaments in different parts of the world. You see, many American golfers who they classify as champions, when they're out of their own backyard, they can't perform. And a champion is a man who can win everywhere in the world. That's the ultimate test. And Tony went around the world winning and promoting golf. I really can't find high enough praise for what this man has done for golf in Britain. There we go, there we go. Gary, Gary, Gary. Okay. Well, Tony, no pressure, Fo follow, follow that. Well, you know, I met Gary, I, I, first of all, I wanna thank him for, for being here and uh, we, we were up at the Bell for a couple of days ago for uh, rainbows and I want to thank him um, for his uh, for just being being along with us it's it's been fantastic I met this man in 19 in the early 60s I went down to South Africa to play the South African circuit as a young man and of course Gary was uh, he was winning everything he was Ten years ahead of me with uh, his open win. Uh, but I remember one of the things he was working on, <laughs> stupid, uh, but he used to work on lots of things because we're all looking for the secret of how to play better. And I think Henry Cotton told him one time that if, if you want to stop hooking the ball, you, you want to stand... Uh, with your left heel up like that. And can you remember this? It's rubbish, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, we're at this tournament in South Africa, and I'm on the putting green with Harold Henning, and Gary's on the first hole, T, and it's not far from the putting green. And I said, there he is, look. <laughs> And he hits his tee shot uh, off the, and he, his balance wasn't great. I said, that was a bit of a wild, Harold. And Harold Henning said, 
It might not be wild, but it, it might have been a bit wild, but he'll win. <laughs> he'll win. And he won. And he won every damn thing he played in in South Africa. They couldn't beat him. I mean, uh, he has had a most remarkable career. And as I said at the Belfry, he's certainly one of the most remarkable people I've met in my lifetime. And uh, uh, we've followed and played so much golf together. Both went to America, which we knew we had to do if we wanted to be better than anybody else, and that was our objective. And uh, I've had some great laughs over the years. Not so easy nowadays with this uh, woke stuff. To, to... <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Uh -oh. It's not so easy, you know. I mean, we, we used to tell all the latest gags and, and so on, and uh, now you, you sort of uh, you get reprimanded for doing stuff <laughs> like that. Okay. Well, before you get into trouble, Tony... Um, let's let's go, go back to the to the beginning because both of you had um, a relatively humble beginnings. Certainly not the beginnings that would suggest that you would necessarily become a professional golfer. Let alone the champions that uh, that you 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 came again, Gary. Let, let, let's start with you. You're in South Africa. Your your dad was a was a golf fanatic, wasn't he? But that didn't mean to say. I mean, you were so far away from becoming a professional golfer. Uh... My mother died when I was nine years of age, and I adored her. Uh, my brother went to war to fight with the British at 17. He went to a marvelous school in Johannesburg, and he wanted to fight with the British at 17. Quite sad that a young man like He came back. My brother-in-law went with him, did not come back. Uh, my sister went to boarding school, and I went to this great school called King Edward VII. This English school in Johannesburg. Thank God I went there. Because education is the light. And they taught us manners. And they taught us world affairs and the greatest sporting facilities. But then I'd go home after an hour and a half of traveling and I'd get to a dark house at nine. Nobody there. I'd cook my own food. I'd make my own bed. I lay in bed every night crying, wishing I was dead. And the greatest gift ever bestowed upon me was that adversity that I had to face up to. And that is single-handedly the reason I became a world champion. Because it teaches you that everybody has adversity. Everybody in this room has it. But you've got to know how to handle it and not feel sorry for yourself. And the word is gratitude. Every night of my life I say a prayer. I never miss a night. And my main theme is gratitude. Just think about us in this room here today. We're all in the 1% of the world. How many people can have a meal like this? How many people have a bed, a TV, an air conditioning? Things we take for granted every days of our lives. Most people don't have any of that. So through golf, this incredible sport, and I got honors for four sports at school, but they could not stand me in good stead. Golf is a passport to the world. I played with every president in America, royal family, leaders all over the world, but also in the poor villages of India and Africa, where I maybe learned more with humility and gratitude. So it's been an epic journey for me. I've traveled more miles than any human being that's ever lived. What an education which I strive for. Even today, I strive for it. So I've been very blessed. He's a hard act to follow, isn't he? <laughs> so what about you, Tony? Okay, you come, come from Scunthorpe, that famous sporting town. Yes. Uh, Kevin Keegan, Ray Clements, Ian Botham, Tony Jacklin. Um, but again, uh, you were obsessed with golf. There wasn't really much else to do, was there? Well, no. It was uh, my good fortune that my dad uh, took uh, to the game through a neighbour and I can remember I was kicking a ball out around in the, in the yard and Eric Marquis was this guy's name. He says, Arthur, I think you'd like golf. You need to come with me tomorrow. And my dad took, 
to the game. He was about 36 years old then. I was eight. And uh, he went. I followed. I pulled his trolley and had a go when we were outside, away from the members' eyes. And uh, so that was the most fortunate thing that ever happened, as far as I was concerned, that my dad took to the game, and I'm thankful that he was alive to see me win my majors, and, and uh, he saw all the, the Ryder Cups. He was a golf fanatic. He loved the game. And uh, as Gary said, it, uh, well, it was my passport as well to, to education. I left school when I was 15. Uh, I traveled the world. And it was my university. And uh, uh, as Gary said, you end up playing golf with uh, kings and uh, royalty, uh, CEOs and presidents of enormous corporations. And you suck it all up and then you learn. And that was my, my education. So uh, it's been a wonderful journey too for me. Gary, would you share with everybody your story? I love this story. Um, your first visit to St Andrews, which of course is where the Open is, is next week. How you got there, how long it took, what you had with you, your little travel bag, because there wasn't much, was there? And where you slept. Well, first of all, I've got to say, one of the most exciting things that happened to me today, this lady lawyer here, this beautiful girl who won the first prize that I went to, I said, are you married? She says, no. I said, well, you put me on your list. You have to have a partner to go to Spain. And she agreed. <laughs> well, I mean. But I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit old for you. I said, I'm a bit old for you. She said, but you're rich enough. Uh, and she said, uh, if you just stay with me till you're 90, that would be sufficient. Uh, <laughs> hey, Gary, Gary, you still got it. You've still got it, Gary. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I took my and got a stiff neck. So okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> 1955. <laughs> you see, one of the reasons I'm going to live to 100 is because I like to laugh, man. It's a, it's, it's a youthful cell that makes you live a long time. And here and I've had a lot of laughs together. But anyway, I arrive at St. Andrews. I played my first tournament down in London here. And I'm going up to St. Andrews. Unlike today, of course, the, I stood on the practice, if I might digress for a minute, I stood on the practice tee the last time I was at the Open and Tiger comes in this G5, Phil Mickelson and this, you know, different jets all of them coming in. And then you see the small planes come in, it's the caddies. And so, and I went by train, everywhere by train. <laughs> and I had a little suitcase, I had 200 pounds in my pocket. A little suitcase, two pairs of pants, two undies, Two shirts. I wash them every day. Now, would you believe it? I'm a millionaire, but I still wash my shirts every night at the hotels because I'm on the go. I'm in a different place every day. So I, I rinse them and I wash them out. It hasn't changed. But anyway, so now I go to the hotels. You know, it's hard to recollect exactly, but the hotels wanted something like 80 pounds a night then. So I couldn't afford it. So I went down to where they did chariots of fire on the beach. And there was a little nook there and the sand dunes, and we went back there uh, to do a little documentary two weeks ago, and I showed them the exact spot. I put my waterproofs on, and I lay in my bag. Perfect night. Next day I went, and I got a room right opposite the 18th green for 10 shillings and sixpence. They said it was facing the sea. It was facing the WC. <laughs> they, the, <laughs> the damn room... <laughs> The room was so small when I put the key in the keyhole, the window cracked, and, uh, and the mice were hunchbacked. And, uh, <laughs> but there was no curtains, so I went and bought a sheet and these little old clothes pegs and put up there because, you know, at night, it's light until 11 o'clock. So, and now I go there and I did three outings and was paid a lot of money as well. <laughs> that was the nice thing about it. And I stayed in their suite, the RNA suite, right opposite the 18th green. And I looked at that and I said, man, I lied. How about this? How fortunate can you be? And I listened about the Dorchester Hotel and the Savoy and this hotel. When you think of the beach, this is a hell of a lot better. 
It's the Grosvenor House, by the way, this hotel. <laughs> oh, um, what did you use for your belt? What did, you didn't have a belt, did you? I did not have a belt. I had the old black knitted tie. And I'd wear that around my belt, around my stomach, because it never creased. And then I'd have a sweater on it to be warm. They said, take your sweater off, but I was too embarrassed. And then at night, I'd wear the tie. So, <laughs> so what did you wear? If you wore the tie at night, yes. what did you use as a belt? <laughs> you roll it up, man. Are you kidding? Or you oh. got a clothes peg. You, yeah, oh. you, there are many ways. You've got to improvise. Okay. And share with us, for everybody who's been to St. Andrews, and what a beautiful place it is, um, it does have a ridiculously wide first fairway, doesn't it? And would you like to share with everybody your, the first time you, you drove on that ridiculously wide first fairway? Can you imagine a young man from South Africa getting on this holy grund, on the first tee at this famous place that was first started in 1754, and the great championships that have blessed and walked the grounds and the historic things that have taken place here. I stand on the first tee, and I, you know, I never choked in golf because I made a comparison of what, how I used to live. I got, I got up tight, but I never choked, but I was very nervous. And the fairway is so wide that Ray Charles couldn't miss it. <laughs> and I hit this damn hook shot, this hook, and I hit the fence, and it came back inside the fairway, thank God. I went to pick up my tea, because in those days you paid two cents a tea. So he picked mine up and anybody else's who was there. So as I'm walking away, the big starter, Dua guy with his kilt on, he says, hey, Lottie, come here a minute. He says, uh, where are you from? I said, I'm from South Africa, sir. And he says, and uh, what's your name? I said, Gary Player. And he says, and what would your handicap be? I said, no, I'm a pro. He says, you're a pro. He says, you must be a hell of a chipper and putter, because you can't hit the ball, lad. <laughs> There's a sequel to that. I come back three years later, and I'm the youngest man to ever win the Open, 23. So now, <laughs> I'm going to imitate him. He sees me coming through the ropes. He says, he says it's, a it's a mirage. <laughs> he says, in fact, it's a bloody miracle. <laughs> you, you, um, uh, were you aware of Gary Player? in the late 50s, Tony. I mean, there was a, the golf wasn't televised then, was it? So how aware were you of this um, machine? Well, I was, I, I was, I loved golf. So, I, you know, we had golf, Golf Illustrated was our magazine. And uh, I suppose Hogan was the biggest name uh, when I started in, in 53. And uh, that was the year he won three of the four majors. And he didn't play in the other one because it was at the same time as one of the others he was playing. Um, and uh, I followed golf. And uh, Golf Illustrated always had, uh, obviously, latest, greatest, everybody. And Gary was all part of that. But as I said earlier, I, 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 it wasn't long. I was 18 years old or so when I met him for the first time in South Africa. Um, I spent, uh, I think I was at his 31st birthday in Australia when I was, I wasn't very old, but I think you uh, celebrated your birthday in Australia with him. Eight years, is it eight years uh, difference, I think, between you two? Eight, nine. Oh, was nine. it your birthday yesterday, by the way? It was, yeah. It was Tony's birthday yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Another... <laughs> Happy birthday, dear. Finish it off. Andy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, it wasn't very long uh, before I was playing with him, you know, is what I'm really getting to. And, in the uh, mid, mid mid 60s we started playing golf together against each other and as Gary will tell you the way, way we learned to play then we didn't have coaches and stuff like that i mean you you watched players that were better than you 
and you'd try to emulate what they did. And you'd go from this guy to that guy to this guy to that guy, and you'd sort it all out the best way you knew how. Uh, and it was Nick Faldo, I think, when he won his Open that put the trophy up and said, David Ledbetter won this, that triggered all of these coach people, coaches. Uh, we didn't have... Nobody had a coach. I mean, give me a break. I mean, we were one-man bands, all of us. I mean, uh, it's a, it was a completely different world. It, Totally different. And, and Tony, I'm right in saying that uh, you did have a spell. You lived in Scunthorpe, which meant steel, steelworks. You actually did work in the steelworks, and then he had the extremely difficult decision to make. Should I stay working in the steelworks or become a professional golfer? I hated it. I hated it. I was an apprentice fitter for a year. I used to clock in at 7.30 in the morning and... Under the guise of, the, I used to give you a chunk of metal to file, and if you screwed it up or got, you know, you'd sling it out and start again. It was, and then I, I got off at twelve o'clock. I got an hour to to for lunch, and I cycled to the golf course, hit balls for twenty minutes, and came back to to the work. But that didn't, you know. I mean, it, obviously, it wasn't very really inspiring, and uh, I started applying for professional, assistant professional jobs, unbeknownst to my parents. And uh, I got an interview uh, in London. There was no club in Lincolnshire that could afford an assistant professional. So it meant leaving home to, to if you wanted to do that, you know, and uh, which of course I was very happy to do, but my parents weren't very keen on it. And, uh, but it all worked out wonderfully and uh, uh, I wouldn't... It's not too bad, was it, Tony? No. I... But I have to say, I have to say, it's golf's, golf's gain, but I think we'll all agree it's British Steel's loss, Tony. <laughs> British Steel's loss, you I know? I want to elaborate on this teaching business. This is fascinating. With all the technology today, the worst teaching is taking place in golf right now. You take the second best player that ever lived, Tiger Woods. I mean, he was on his way... <laughs> He doesn't... No, they no think, you, you they read think that you wrong. Think. You read that wrong. Uh, Nicholas won 18 majors, and he finished second 19 times. But only your dog knows, and your wife knows, who finished the second. But be that as it may. Tiger Woods... <laughs> Tiger Woods is on his way now to being the greatest player that ever lived. And if he... If Tiger Woods had what I call CTR, chosen the right, he would have won 20 majors minimum. He made a lot of bad choices, which we all do, and it's very easy to do, and I'm not critical of it. But he goes along and he wins the, think about this, he wins the US Open by 15 shots. It's not on. It's not on. The next week he's having a lesson from a guy who can't break 80. The following week he's having a lesson from a guy who can't break 85. So they teach him to lay the club off, which is the worst thing to do, and to suck the club in here when you've got to get your weight across. So they just absolutely destroyed this super, probably would have gone out as the greatest athlete, men or women, the planet had ever known. That's how close he was. And he never wins another major for 11 years. Think about that. And now you find there are 12 guys today. Trevor Emmerman, Mike Weir, Ian Baker Finch. You can go right down the line. Uh, Martin Keimer, David DeVal. Not won tournaments, won majors. Can't play anymore can't play anymore from being major championship winners. They go to these coaches who've never been in the arena. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. They read something about in a book, and they are convincing, boy. They are great salesmen. And arrivederci, Roma. <laughs> Sayonara. you never see them again. Can I... Um... Gary, can I, can I just say it's a, it's a real pleasure to have a table of golf coaches just uh, sitting over there. Um, so I'm thanks for that. that. I'm talking about teaching pros. Yeah. I'm not talking about teaching your members, your ladies, your juniors. They are perfect, but not everybody's got a, they're lost in life, their category. And their category is not to be teaching Tiger Woods. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
So, uh, 1959, you win uh, your first Open. And I think I might have been saying, Gary, you would actually thought you'd blown it, didn't you? You thought you'd blown the Open at the death to the point where you didn't even hang around, did you? You just walked back to the hotel. Not quite right, but I did think I'd blown it. Yes, I had a six on the last hole in a strong wind and, and rain. And I needed four for 66 and had a six on the last hole. Very, very difficult hole, Muirfield, if the wind's blowing. Extremely difficult hole. And uh, they said, you might tie. So uh, if you do tie, you have a 36-hole playoff tomorrow. Can you imagine that? 36-hole. You just played 36 holes, but you'll have 36-hole playoff tomorrow. So I went back to the hotel and I put on a white suit. And I walked up and down that driveway to the highway in the club. Because I finished, I was seven shots back. And I told my sponsor, I said, you're going to see me win tomorrow. He said, my dear chap, nobody at 23 has even thought about winning the Open. Are you dreaming? And I said, you watch, I'll win tomorrow. And I walked up and down and up and down. And thank goodness I won. Because you see, the Open Championship, much to the disgust of most Americans, they don't understand that the Open Championship is the greatest championship on the planet. Yeah. No. No. Now, although my family tree, this side is English and this side is Scottish, I'm still a South African, so I'm able to judge fairly and to say, you know, you win the Open here. You don't need a yardage book. Today they've got books to read the green. They have three practice rounds. Ray Charles can read the damn green after three practice rounds. <laughs> and they, they stand like this when they read a green. There's no, they stand like this. And I, it's just beyond my comprehension, but they're stopping that baloney. But anyway, you play in the open. You don't need, you've got to use, you see, there's a great saying, trust instinct to the end, though it render no reason. And you stand there and you've got 150 yards and you take a wedge. Tomorrow morning you wake up, you've got 150 yards, you take a three wood. That never happens in American golf. I can play golf in South Africa, Australia, and America. I can stand there and not even look at the green. How far is it to my caddy? 150 yards. Give me the eight iron. Automatic. So here you put it in a bunker and you play out backwards at St. Andrews. And I hear the Americans say, it's not fair. I said, well, life ain't meant to be fair. <laughs> you know? So it, it tests you in a completely different way. You hit a ball and it bounces to the right. They've got all these bloody mounds where they buried most of their members. <laughs> to the right. <laughs> Do you know, Gary? <laughs> Gary, Gary. <laughs> Gary, you've got to get off the fence sometimes and say what you really think. <laughs> you know? By the way, I had no idea Ray Charles would feature quite so regularly <laughs> in, in this interview. Tony, um, uh, try and be unbiased if you can. Is the Open the greatest major in golf? No question. No question about that. Um, and Lynx is my favourite form of golf, but, but my personal favourite. I mean, because you have to be imaginative and it, it, even... You, you have to just choose a club that will get the job done. And you, you have to be able to weigh the odds on a shot coming off. Uh, you have to have unbelievable, enormous patience uh, on Lynx golf courses because you, you, you can't win before you play, you know. You've got you've to go through, thread the ball through the bunker, stay out of the bunkers, do all of the... It, it's... it's the full examination is what Lynx golf is. And uh, the wind's never the same two days in a row. Everybody's going to get bad bounces, so you've got to swallow that up and, and uh, stay positive. I love it. I think you, I, I do think the US Open's the hardest one to win, personally. We both won, well, he's won a lot more than me, obviously. But... Uh, I do think the US Open, from a standing start, the way they push the, the, the envelope with the greens, and uh, it, it's, it's a tough, tough one to win. And especially, you've got the might of America there all the time on that. I think a, a, lot, of, a lot of the uh, the open courses, they're not easy to attack. 
the hour open I'm talking about. You've got, you've got to have this patience. You've got to realise that, you know, nobody's going to... I, I, when I won my championship at Lytham, uh, nobody's going to come at you with the old clubs and everything back then. Nobody's going to come and shoot 62 on you in on the conditions that you play uh, on the open. I think somebody might... Well, in fact, I know somebody's going to shoot 62 this next week yes. at, at uh, yes. St Andrews. And somebody might shoot 59 or 58 as well if the weather's benign, which is a shame. But, but that's nothing to do with the course. That's more to do with what uh, they've done or lack of what they've done with the golf ball. So, uh, but we'll see. And uh, what a great game, though, all together. I mean, you know, just all together, you've got these different golf courses, you've got links golf, you've got uh, thousands of different opportunities to enjoy this great game around the world. There's resorts all over the planet now. It's a spectacular game altogether. Well, yeah, let me enlarge on that a minute. Please you do. See, you take, um, my wife and I, when she was alive, we had great, she was loved tennis. She was a scratch golfer. She often beat New York level. But I tell you what, she believed tennis to win the major of tennis was harder than golf. And I said, Viv, how can you possibly say that? If you play golf, even at your home club, you play in the morning and you play in the afternoon at a different golf course. People have been in bunkers. The greens are more trodden on. You know, it's just... You've got dew in the morning, you've got no dew in the afternoon, you have a bit of wind, you don't have wind. Now, when you win a major championship, you play in the morning, and man, it's a perfect day. And you tee off for the afternoon, and now you've got a 20 mile an hour wind. Boy, you've got to have some tochas to get out there <laughs> and, and, and play under those conditions. You know when they had such a great morning. So with tennis, I play against Djokovic. Doesn't matter what it is, it's the same conditions. Zero, whoever you play. So, I mean, to, and, to, and you've only got to win, well, I say only, you've got to win seven matches to win Wimbledon. You've got to beat 156 guys to win a major. No, there's no comparison. There we go. Right. <laughs> Unless you're playing Kyrgios. Unless you're playing Kyrgios, who our man, of course, is this afternoon. Um, so let's, uh, let's get to 69, one of Tony's great moments. Tony wins uh, the, the, uh, the Open, of course, at, at Lytham. And, and Tony, all the stars seemed to align, didn't they, for you? Uh, you had, over the last couple of years, really got up to being one of the best in the world. I think about it saying it was the first televised tournament, colour TV, was it not? It was, yeah. So you, you waited, obviously, Tony, until it was colour, uh, before you decided to win. Um, and it all, it all works beautifully uh, for you. Share with us, everybody has a, a, a memorable shot in their lives. One of yours was the... The drive, was it, on the 18th, knowing you just had to get through that last hole. But it was a difficult shot. Yeah, it was, because there was no layup then with the old clubs. There was a cross bunker that you couldn't clear with a one iron, or I couldn't clear it with a one iron. And the bunkers were so well placed, left and right, mm. that you just had to hit the perfect shot, the, the driver, with the driver, and uh, managed to... To, to do that, and, and I can remember my thoughts uh, right now, you know, it's, uh, this is what you work for, this is what you practice for, just keep it wide and smooth, and as I was thinking it, I was doing it. You took a, <laughs> you took a driver. You, now, that, let me tell you, that's amazing. Yep. Yeah. He took a driver to win. Now, yep. the man, if you're the right thing to do is take a three iron. Because those bunkers are, like, honestly, from here, from here to this table apart. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. And you saw uh, Adam Scott. Yeah. He lost it putting it in the bunker. Yeah. But so, he did win. He did no, win, I'm, Gary. I'm trying to say what a, what, a, what, a, what a mind he had or what a mindset and what I said, how aggressive he was. And he takes a driver. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, well, I, and I was aware that uh, Dave Thomas and Eric Brown and I think Christy Senior had, had all come to that hole with with an opportunity to win, and those bunkers were the doing of them. You have to stay out of the bunkers on any Lynx golf course 
especially off the tee, because they're one shot penalty, whether you like it or not. And that's, of course, how Tiger won. I think it was Hoylake or, uh, and, and St Andrews. He's won there twice, I know. But he never went in a fairway bunker. And that's the key to, to, uh, to Link's golf. You've got to stay out of those traps. So you hit that wonderful shot. You're walking down the fairway to the acclaim of the crowd. You're waving, OK? You're about to win the Open. And then what happened to the shoe? Yeah, well... Uh, they, they, of course, they let the crowd in, and uh, w before we got where we needed to be in the clear, and somebody stomped on my heel, and uh, my shoe came off, and I had to carry it. I couldn't stop in the crowd and put it back on, because I, I'd have got knocked over. So I, I sort of uh, peg legged it through, and, and when I, when I when I got clear of everybody, I put it back on, and. Even then, I didn't stop to lace it up because it would have been not the thing to do, if you know what I mean. But uh, it was a great week, that. And, and, you know, I managed to win in America the year before, which was uh, gave me the, I think, fortitude to, to take the heat. I got a lot of support from the local crowd. I sensed there was anticipation in them when I got to Lytham. I, I had bigger galleries than normal in practice and so on. And um, managed to hold on and beat our good friend Robert, Sir Robert Charles, who was... Uh, Did you need a four to win the Open? Pardon? Did you need a four or a five to win? I needed... Uh, I was two in front. And, and it was interesting... He hit his tee shot, Bob, left hand, and there's a bunker on the right near where that flag, there's a flagpole there on the right side. And he, I watched his ball all the way, watched it finish, and I watched it miss the bunker. And he said to his caddy, oh, it could be, I think I'm in the bunker. And I don't know to this day whether... He did it to try and get me to relax a bit. But I watched his ball to the end, and I knew he wasn't in the bunker. I knew he was absolutely fine. And uh, as I said, I, you know, I just had to hit the shot and managed to, to pull it off. It was, uh, it was uh, a nice, nice uh, end to the week. So that walk, nice end to the week. <laughs> So, so that walk, even if you're walking holding one shoe in your hand, Gary, you, you've been there. Is that one of the greatest walks in golf, in sport, in life, walking down the 18th knowing you've, you're just about to win the Clarence Jug? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you just, and you like the Roman um, arena, you know, uh, and the you're inundated with large crowds and they're cheering you on. You know, it, you get goose pimples and everybody looks at it a different way. You know, you know, they say when you die, I don't know, that many things flash through your mind quickly. When you walk along there, you think of your hard work and you think of your good wife and your children. And, you know, you were poor and here you're winning the greatest championship in the world. And my greatest shot was at Carnoustie. I'm playing with Jack Nicholas. I'm one ahead of him. Bob Charles, Billy Casper, and Morris Brenridge were all one shot behind me, four of them. And we came to the spectacles at Carnoustie, and I went back the other day, and I lay on the ground, and I just kissed the spot that I hit the shot. There was that flag fluttering in the breeze, and I took a three-wood, and they got two spectacle bunkers. If you go in there, it's out of a detchy. And I hit this three-wood. It went so straight, I had to lean over sideways to see the flag. <laughs> and finished <laughs> you're in the wrong game laddie. <laughs> <laughs> and finished that far from the hole can you imagine hitting a shot like that then I came to I the remember. last hole you remember? I remember I was there yeah. and I come to the last hole and unlike Van der Velde and Vive La France I take a three iron and a four iron and a wedge Van der Velde takes a driver if I was him I would take a six iron six iron and wedge three shot lead and he loses the two worst things that ever happened to golf, Tony Jacklin at Muirfield, we won't elaborate on it, 
and also Van der Velde, the two worst things I've ever seen. I, I'm glad you finished it. You said two worst things in golf. Tony Jacklin, pause, I think. Are you going to say anything else? You're going to leave it at that. Um, yes, we won't elaborate on that. What we will say, though, before we talk about the clout jug in the Open is, Tony, in 1970, you went on to win uh, the US Open. And what, I can't believe you did this, okay, but after you won the, the US Open, okay, you were given a very, very nice winner's check, weren't you? It went to the cleaners in the back uh, pocket of my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much was it for? It was thirty thousand uh, dollars, and I put it in the back pocket of my pants, and they went to the cleaners, and I, everything got cleaned out. <laughs> anyway, they were kind enough to write me another check. It was fine. Yeah. Can you, can you believe you did that? No, I mean, you know, it was it's part of life, isn't it? But you, you, <laughs> I didn't, yeah. Uh, I will say this. That, that I had a, he, he became a dear friend, my caddy, Tom Murphy. He, he, uh, I, I gave him a $3,000 check, 10%, and he put him through college. And he was the youngest in, in a big family, and, and he became a multimillionaire himself. Um, we kept in touch. Um, Till he died about six years ago now, seven years. I played golf with him the week before he died. He was only 63 when he passed. And uh, it was a wonderful re relationship we kept uh, uh, till his dying. He, he lived up in Rochester, Minnesota, had sports bars. He owned golf courses in Arizona. And a uh, fabulous guy. And I uh, was so sad when he passed. And during this period of time, Gary and, and Tony, I mean, what, a, what a time to be alive and what, a, what an era for golf because apart from you two, of course, there was Arnold Palmer, there was Jack Nicholas, there was Lee Trevino, there was Tom Weisskopf. I mean, the names just, just reel off. You were both represented by IMG. So, of course, they also represented Jean-Claude Killy, Jackie Stewart, Gene Shrimpton, I think they, uh, they represented as well. And the Pope. And the Pope. There we go. <laughs> yeah. In... In that order, in that order, ladies and gentlemen. So what a time to be alive, hey? Well, you know, it's not bad being alive now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> man, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live to be 100, man, unless I get some damn disease or something. And the odds are, the odds are one out of every men in this room will, one out of every two men in this room will get cancer one of every three women will get cancer. So this is unfortunately the times we're living in. So any time you're living any day, life is such a great gift that's bestowed upon you. And that's why you've got to enjoy every single day, haven't you? Well, I think we're enjoying today, so that's 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 Absolutely. it. That's a good start. Let's talk about that '74 win for you, your third your third Open, uh, mainly because it was in your third decade that you did it. And and I know uh, to you and to a lot of people as well, uh, when you measure greatness in in sport, it's not just how many you've won or of what. It, it's the period of time. It's longevity. And one thing that we could certainly say about you, Mr. Gary Player, is that uh, a, a longevity. Uh, you've been winning uh, trophies. You still were until you finally packed up. Um, but uh, during the regular uh, uh, tour tournaments, the longevity of you winning in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s uh, in the Open is, is pretty remarkable. Well, I've always believed when you're judging who the best players that ever lived, I think longevity is something that's just put to the side. I think longevity is very important. Like Sam Snead was the greatest athlete golf ever had. He might be the best player that ever lived. He went to war for five years, as Hogan did in their prime. So they might have won more majors than anybody else. Uh, if you go to the other extreme, a man like Severiano Ballesteros, who we all loved and adored, he won his last major at 31. 31. We were just warming up then. So, you know, Nick Felder won his last major at 39. So, you know, uh, Nicholas won his last major at 46. That's impressive. So, uh, you know, to win tournaments, longevity means you had an engine that was working. 
you know, you'd had a Rolls Royce engine. And so uh, to me, that's a very big thing, I think. And, uh, but we're seeing things in golf now that I actually predicted. You're going to see people hitting the ball unless they do something about it, 500 yards. You've never had a big man play golf yet. They're coming. When you see first prizes of a million, two million, three million, four million for a tournament, man, these people in China, I'm telling you something, while you're having breakfast in, in bed, this guy's been on the practice seat for two hours already. They're building in universities. They're building men. When I said you've got to start using weights, oh, you can't use weights. Well, I'm 86 years of age, and I'm still pushing 350 pounds with my legs. I'm going to the gym when I leave here. I'm going to do hundreds of sit-ups. I'm going to run the treadmill at max. You, you've got to keep fit. You've got to keep strong because it helps keep your strong mind. And we have, we're in our infancy now. We're in our infancy. But we, we, unless they do something. You hear what Tony said? If they have benign weather at St. Andrews this week, maybe somebody will break 60. They'll drive seven greens. They're going to drive seven greens. They're going to have people stand on the first tee at St. Andrews and drive over the first green. We ain't seen nothing yet. So they, the authorities have got to wake up because they, it's, it's ruining the game, I think. By the way, Tony's still a youngster. This man is 86 years old. <laughs> How many... But he is slacking because he used to do a 1,000 sit-ups a day, and now you, you only do 200, don't you, Gary? <laughs> Yeah, but you know, when I was younger, I could see my talkers. Now I can't, you see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it applies to a lot of you guys, too. <laughs> Tony, Tony just said, don't encouraging. Um, <laughs> now, now. You're going to have to take a back seat for a second, Gary, if that's at all possible, because we have here Mr. Ryder Cup, okay? And I will get your views on this as well, Gary. Before we talk about um, Seve and uh, Seve and, and captaining uh, Europe, uh, you, you played six, you lost five, because you played seven and lost six and drew one as a player. Is that correct? Yeah. We had yeah. one tie. Yes. And we lost... To, uh, the, I lost so, yes, yeah. yeah, because that's what America used to do. But the one tie has gone down in history. 69, the same year that you, you, you win the Open, of course. And for those who do know the story, you can never hear this story enough. And for those who don't hear this story, settle back and listen to one of the greatest acts of sportsmanship. You may have a different view, Gary. We'll get, we'll get your opinion in a second. Explain the concession to everybody, please. Yeah, well, we were, Jack and I were in the final group. And uh, uh, <laughs> we, were, we played 36 holes in those days the last day. Anyway, I got one down on 16, and, th and then I hold a putt from here to that cor far corner on the 17th for an eagle to, to get back to all square with Jack. At the same time as this putt went in, there was a roar of the, a massive roar obviously went in. Brian Huggett was on the last green with a four and a half, five footer. And he thought that but the roar was me beating Jack. And he's a tenacious little player, Huggett. And he held the putt and he sort of broke down on Eric Brown's lapel, you know, he thought he'd hold the putt to win the Ryder Cup. <laughs> and Eric said, no, no, that was Jacqueline just getting even, you know. So that was a bit of a, a bummer for, for Brian. He didn't... Anyway, I digress. Uh, we stood on 18T, all square, and I'm telling you, this is not where you want to be. All your teammates around the green, everybody, you know, last two on the course, their outcome depends on you. And... Uh, we both hit three wood off the tee, good shots, and I head ahead of Jack, and he hollered after me, Tony, and I waited and he caught me up. He said, uh, we were walking together then, he said, just wanted to ask you, are you nervous? I said, Jack, I'm bloody petrified. <laughs> and he said, I just thought I'd ask you, because 
if it's any consolation, I feel just the same way you do. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth, absolute verbatim, the truth. And uh, it, it put it all in perspective. We both hit good shots onto the onto the green. I was 30 feet past. He was 20 feet. I put it up this far, 20 inches to two feet. That's his, he's said it many times. And he hit his 20 footer that he had. I marked my ball. He hit his 20 footer five foot past, too far past for me to say, good, good. It wasn't, it wouldn't have been right to, to do it. So like the great player he is, he, he holds his putt and in the, after holding it, in the picking, well, before he picked his ball out of the hole, he picked my marker up in the same, and conceded my putt and said, I don't believe you would have missed that, but I would never give you the opportunity in these circumstances. And, and it was a marvelous thing. You know, I'd won the Open two months before or whatever. Uh, I suppose it's fair to say England and a, a, a hero. He didn't want to see anything happen to spoil that. I think I would have made it, but who? We'll never know. We'll never know. I've had a few seizures since then, I can tell you that. <laughs> you would have done it, Tony. You would have done it. <laughs> uh, um, did, and and the, their captain, Sam Sneed, he wasn't happy about well, that, was he? Uh, yeah, Jack, we've talked about it often. Uh, that nobody said anything to Jack, but it supposedly Sneed said, we didn't come over here to be good old boys. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but... And, and it's interesting that they, they did a book, or uh, a guy did a book on that whole uh, Ryder Cup. And they didn't call it the concession, they called it Battle in the Dunes or something. And this guy interviewed all the American team and all the British team that was still alive. And... Uh, it's amazing how many of the American guys said, well, I would have never done, I would have never given Jacqueline that part. You know, they would have. Gary, would you have done the same? I sincerely hope I would have, uh, but that's not uh, for me to praise myself. I would, <laughs> I would say this. Uh, what, I, <laughs> what I do say is that Jack Nicholas, who is probably be my best friend in golf today, he is, without a doubt, the greatest gentleman I ever played golf with. Never mind how great he is. And, and so, I'm, you know, I was not, I watched that. I watched that with great interest, and I was not surprised. But to give you an example, we had the President's Cup in South Africa, and we had Els and Tiger in a playoff to decide who was going to win. It was getting dark. They had to get back to America for Thanksgiving. Reservations would have been hard to get, and Jack and I got together and we said, this has been such a great uh, match. We've got to call it a tie. And Jack said, well, no, then we'll retain the trophy. Then I said, no, we'll play on. <laughs> and so Jack said, no, okay, we'll, we'll split the trophy. And we did. And then to enlarge on that, I played Jack in that Piccadilly uh, final twice at Wentworth when it was wet and old and long. And... Uh, I'm on the tee there, and I'm, I like to draw the ball. And my, he said to me, you're not drawing it because your hand is not sufficiently to the right. Put your strength in your right hand. And I'm playing him in the final. And I beat him six and four. Right. And he came out, and he shook my hand just like, like you are, your best friend. And I mean, so nothing surprises me at Jack Nicholas. He has been the ultimate gentleman. He, he just were, I, he had a... His dad, Charlie, who I knew and played golf with as well, uh, Jack played amateur golf, uh, a, a lot of amateur golf, and I think that's where his interpretation yes. of sportsmanship and fairness came in. I remember yeah. him telling me a story once that uh, he didn't treat an opponent the way Charlie, his dad, thought he should have yes, yes. and he he took that as a, a, a lesson yes. for all time but he he got his his values of the game of golf 
through his early amateur days. I'm bound to say that because I know it's I know it to be true. So that was in the Ryder Cup, okay, and then um, 1983. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, you were asked to be a European Ryder Cup captain. The only reason why I say somewhat surprisingly, because as you know, no, you weren't necessarily part of the old guard, were you? But uh, they realised things had to change because America kept kept winning. Yeah, well, and they didn't they didn't uh, uh, approach me about being the captain uh, till six months before the matches. I mean, historically, you get to know 18 months before the matches, so you can do a lot of prep work. And, and also, I didn't get any captain's picks because we were into the season, and it, it, I, so I had to take the top 12 in the order of merit. And I, I, actually, that was one of the great performances of all time. We only lost by a single point uh, at, at Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, and we, like I say, we went with the 12 players all down, straight down the list. And it was Seve that we, I mean, we were gutted not winning that. We got so close, so, so close. And I, I can, I've got a video, an old V8 video at home of us up on the dais and everybody was sort of, you know, down. And it was actually Seve that said, you, you, you shouldn't be so sad. You know, this is the best we've ever done in America. And, and he, of course, he was right. We got, we got to win it in 85. But uh, that was a hell of a performance in 83 from, from that team. And, uh, and you persuaded Seve, did it? You needed Seve. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, t I, I had a long breakfast with him at the Prince Wales Hotel in Southport. Uh, because, you know, Seve, Seve didn't get on with the hierarchy of the European tour either. I mean, he was his own man. And uh, I, I, when, when I agreed to be captain, uh, on the basis that he gave me carte blanche to do what I wanted, I, did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would have walked if they'd have said, you know, we'll tell you what to do kind of thing. Um, but uh, I had this breakfast with Savvy and he vented, <laughs> he vented for a long time and I said, I know, they're a shower. You don't have to tell me, uh, but I, I've i accepted this job and I can't do it without you. And I need you. And in the end, he said, okay, I help you. <laughs> that, that was a bit of an understatement, actually. He, he helped me all right. He was unbelievable. I'm going to tell you my last encounter with Seve on a Bellasturis. I won the Masters at 42 and he played with me. And uh, I, shot, I was seven behind Tom Watson and the guys and I shot, came back in 30 and shot 64 and won. And I just, I just love Seve. He comes running across the green and he puts his arms around me and says, Gary, I love you, my brother. He says, you teach me how to win Masters. And he won it, uh, not the following year, but the following year. And then my last time I saw him, man, it was terrible. He was leaving the golf club. And I came out of the locker room, he's driving out, and I went, Pshht! and he heard me and he stopped. And I ran to the car and I said, adios, compadre, suerte. And he says, Gary, in fact, I'll get quite choked. He says, Gary, why are you always so happy? So I told him a few things. He said, you know, me no happy. And a tear rolled out his cheek. And he said, my father-in-law, he say to my wife, why are you married a champion caddy? You know, his father-in-law was one of the wealthiest men in Spain. Well, if you're the champion caddy in the world, that's quite an accomplishment, let me tell you. But not only that, he was a champion golfer and a, the greatest ambassador, or his greatest ambassador at that time in Spain had ever had. And he should have been proud of it. And so he, was, he had a miserable latter part of his life. And then, of course... He had the double cancer in his brain and died at 52. So uh, it's quite sad. Yeah. yeah, make the most of life and enjoy it. We're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time, so we've got to, we've got to finish with two I say, simple questions to ask. There may not be simple questions to answer. Greatest win, we'll start with you, Gary, then Tony. Greatest win and greatest achievement in life, assuming that there may not be the same answer. Off you go, Gary. 
uh, we talk about golf wise. Great, uh, yes, greatest golf, golf win, but greatest, greatest achievement doesn't yeah, have to the, be golf. Golf wise, uh, obviously, I'm going to say my family if it's not golf. But uh, golf wise, being the only man in the world to win the Grand Slam on the regular tour and senior tour, because nobody's ever done that. So, and they all try. And achievement. If that's your greatest win. What's your greatest I, achievement I think in life? The, the greatest achievement in golf is that in life. Uh, yeah, no, no, let's stick to golf. In golf, that uh, during my company and our outings, and uh, generally we raised uh, fifty million dollars or more for charity, which changed the lives of thousands of people around the world. And let me enlarge on that and say the PGA. That's why. The PGA means so much to me as against the Live Tour, because our dreams were fulfilled there. And and the PGA has raised three billion dollars for charity, which is more than any other two sports together. And that's what we're here for today, is to raise money for, you know, when I think of the charity that it's for today, I've had five members of my family that have had cancer. And these people come along and they comfort you and they do a hell of a job. So well done on the organizers of today. Okay. <laughs> Last word to the national treasure, that is Mr. Tony Jacklin. Tony, um, it could be your Open win, it could be your US Open win, it could be you know, what you achieved as European Ryder Cup captain, your greatest win, and your greatest achievement in life. Uh, well, I think my, uh, it's a so di difficult question. I mean, the Ryder Cup business was emotionally the most extraordinary experience I had. Dealing with 12 individuals, keeping them loose and trying to, and ultimately winning for the first time in America, all that. It, it, it's, uh, as an individual achievement, my US Open win gives me the most satisfaction because I, I won going away. I led and increased my lead every day. So that was that. But it's, it's, it's such a hard question. The Ryder Cup thing was an, an emotional roller coaster. And the satisfaction of uh, being able to take these guys over the winning line was was uh, enormous. I mean, uh, incredible. And and from a personal standpoint, I mean, uh, hell, my kids, I suppose. I've got six of them, one way or another. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've uh, two wives. Uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> first wife died long ago now, uh, 34 or five years ago. And uh, uh, we have uh, six kids between us, one, one between us and three from my first marriage and, and I inherited two from her first marriage. And they all do great. They're all fantastic. They're all independent. That is... <laughs> Enormous for me. Fantastic. We did relate it to golf. We did relate it to golf. Yes. Uh, I, must, I must not end up on that, if you don't mind, because I have 22 grandchildren. One wife. I've only got 15. <laughs> so. Okay. One, one, one wife for 72 years and two great-grandchildren. And I loved what John said today. His five children work for him. I worked for my 22 grandchildren. <laughs> My six children and my two great-grandchildren. So I've got to win a tournament just to break even. There we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hang on. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, 37 grandchildren, 11 majors, Gary Player and Tony Jacklin. Yeah.